Where Kindness Lives is designed to cultivate a kinder world by helping to inform and inspire. Hosted by Jenny Sager from Nextdoor, the neighborhood network connecting you to what truly matters so you can belong. We'll chat to the most thought-provoking individuals paving the way for positive change and hear from neighbors who deliver small acts of kindness every day. So come on a journey to where kindness lives. Our guest today is tackling one of the toughest issues facing America, how to pay your rent while we're in the middle of a cost of living crisis. For many, instead of living the American dream, it's about pure survival. They say the simplest of ideas are the hardest to pull off, and entrepreneur Encore Jane has done just that. He's founded a company called Built, which allows you to earn reward points from paying your rent, paving a way to home ownership. At 33, Encore has a very impressive resume. He was handpicked by Barack Obama to help young entrepreneurs solve problems from housing to healthcare. He's been named a young global leader by the World Economic Forum and Forbes Best Under 30. Encore Jane, welcome to Where Kindness Lives. Thanks for having me. Well, the first thing we always ask all of our guests is what does kindness mean to you? Kindness isn't about the pleasantries and all the kind of like fake niceties. It's just about being able to actually take 10 seconds out of your life and think about what's going through the other person's life. Like what happened to them this morning? Why are they reacting a certain way? And if you just, you can be as direct and blunt as you need to be and still be kind if you've just taken into account what the other person's view of the world is. And is there someone in your life that you feel like has been particularly kind to you over the years? Yeah, to, uh, to the point where it forced learning empathy on, on all of my brother, sister, and I was my, our mom. I mean, she, uh, we came from immigrant parents. Our parents were born in India and kind of came to the U.S. with nothing and were able to follow that American dream and, and seeing them go through the ups and the downs and with all of us and no matter how frustrated or angry I would get, the way she could respond to understand why I was feeling the way I was or my brother or my sister, um, that was a very special skill and trait that we all try to emulate. Definitely. And I am also a New Yorker and the sense of community is super strong in New York, which I think if you don't live here, people don't always understand that. And that is definitely true for New York City too, isn't it? It's a hyper, hyper local though. You know, like I'm a, I'm a West Village downtown guy. It is amazing how, I mean, I think the fact that you can have that type of deep attachment to a six block radius is very special and unique to New York. Definitely. And that definitely comes through in next door. Next door, people are very passionate about where they live. Why do you think that sense of community is important? Like, how does that influence your day to day? So it's funny. I, uh, this was probably three years ago. I was invited to a dinner uh, with Governor Kasich. Um, and he starts this dinner. St- I walk in. I'm the only person in the room, probably under 40, and starts yelling at me. And he goes, you millennials, and da da da. I'm like, oh, did I do something? <laughs> I don't know what happened. He goes, he goes, the problem, he goes, is that the millennial generation does not have religion, and therefore have lost that sense of purpose and community. And I said back, I said, maybe, but also we're finding purpose and community in other ways, right? And some of that is through online communities, and a lot of that is through your local, like where you live, communities. Um, and so I do think that. You know, whether it's, you know, Governor Kasich's view as religion or whether it's your local neighborhood, having a group that can give you a shared sense of purpose, a place to kind of ride the ups and downs with and to not feel alone is super important. And I think the minute people start feeling alone, you start that's when anarchy starts. To yeah, definitely. And we're, it's, it's really important right now because we are in tough economic times and we know that the rising cost of living and this global recession are actually making people stay home more because they don't have as much money to spend yeah. going out and socialization is becoming a little bit of a luxury. Are you feeling that and seeing that in New York City right now? So it's, it's interesting. Cost of living is going up. I think what's you know, both a scary uh, thought and also a a testament to the importance of community though, is that despite cost of living going up, people are actually just having to spend more because the the idea of sacrificing the social life that you have around you is just not something that is livable, right? And so you're seeing people, you know, 
find new ways to scrap together to still be able to go out with the friends and have a dinner or go out for a drink. And you see that in New York. I mean, New York is full of 25-year-olds who are 40, 50% of their income is on rent, right? And yet still that social element is so important. Um, you know, unfortunately it just means it's harder and harder to save. <laughs> yeah, but this does relate directly to built. And I do want to talk about that because you are, you've come up with a way to help renters essentially. So talk about that and, and how you, how and why that was important to you and how it can actually help people right now. I mean, look, I think it's, the system has totally broken, right? I mean, you, you work, you do everything you're supposed to do. You go to the school, you take out the student loans, you get the good job, you move to the city, you sign an apartment with 500 guarantees just to move in. And then somehow you're supposed to be able to save to buy a home or to be able to invest or do all these things they tell you to do and it's just not possible, yeah. right? And so we started saying, you know, rather than trying to say you either have to give up or you know, it's your fault, can we actually turn this around to work for you, right? Can your biggest expense of paying rent actually be the thing that opens up all the possibilities, whether that's traveling the world or buying a home or, or doing the things you love. And so we took a concept that people know from travel, right? You can book a flight and earn miles and then you actually can save your way into the trip of your dreams. So what if just paying rent was not throwing your money away, but actually the key to building your credit? What if paying rent was actually how you earned free travel? And, and what if paying rent was actually the path to buying a home? Right? I mean, that change, it flips the whole dynamic on its head. And it took a lot of rethinking how you align interests across the real estate industry, the payments world, the travel world, and ultimately do it in the benefit of the consumer. Because the one thing I think has been missing in the housing market is like, historically, no one likes their landlord. And so if you can flip that whole dynamic and say, actually, housing and paying rent is your most empowering, your most rewarding expense. I mean, it changes the way that I think our generation can look at what you're able to do um, in your 20s and 30s and beyond. And how hard is it to change that culture? Because New York especially is, I think it's 80% of people are still paying their rent yes. by check, which always amazes me. So how do you, how do you convince people, not landlords mostly, how do you convince sure. them? Well, let's start with like, so what, what is built, right? Yeah. So built is the first rewards program where you pay your rent and you earn points, mm -hmm. right? That's simple. You pay your rent, we actually build your credit score by reporting those to the bureau so that paying your rent builds your credit and gets you access to financial products. And built just by paying your rent rewards you with savings towards a home when you're ready to buy. So that's, that's the built platform. Now, there's two ways to try to bring innovation to market. One is you can force it through and hope that you break the system enough <laughs> that it's too late to put it back together. I think we saw some of that in the early tech era. <clears throat> In today's market, though, people have like they've wisened up, and the government is ready to pounce, and the incumbent industries are ready to pounce. So we took a different approach, which was rather than fight them, how do I realign their incentives so that everybody wins by doing what's in the interest of the consumer? And so it was a complex ecosystem play, but now landlords love rewarding their renters because when they reward their renters, their renters stay a little bit longer. You renew one more lease, think about it. Every time someone leaves, by the 50% of renters leave the buildings every single year. Every time someone leaves, you have four weeks of lost rent, Yeah. right? So you can penny pinch over $50, $100, you just lost $2,000 of rent, right? Every time a landlord rewards their renters on rent, we're opening up a channel for them to participate in the spend in the local community. Right? And we partner with the local community merchants to give them a way to, to reach renters in their homes. And we participate with the banks to say, here's a better way to process payments. I mean, every credit card company, every payments company is trying to get into the coffee transaction that's $3. What if you could be in the payments flow for $2,000 a month every single month for every person in the city? Right? And so you just have to start to rethink people's incentives um, and do it in the spirit of the consumer. And I think, long story short, very complex ecosystem, very simple customer value prop, which is pay rent, get rewarded. 
And what, what does Bill to get out of this? Like, how do you make money out of this? Same, same exact thing. He aligned our incentives with the consumer. So as the customer and the consumer earns rewards from spend, which are funded by whether it's the landlords, the local merchants, the banks, the payment networks, the airline companies, because everybody at the end of the day wants that 21, 30 year old, 35 year old to come in from the local residential building and choose their local store over the other, right? And so as the customer earns rewards through spend, we earn a margin too. And so we're all aligned in kind of serving the customer um, in this ecosystem. And why was this important to you personally? I lived in California and I lived in New York. It did the two most ungodly expensive cities in this country. And every month when you see that payment, it doesn't matter whether you can afford it or not. There is nothing more painful than seeing that deduct from your bank account every single month and have nothing to show for it. And you know what? It doesn't change the fact that it's still painful to see it go out of your bank, but it's a little nicer knowing that at least after two months I can fly to London and see a friend or that after a couple years I could use it to cover a down payment, right? And so there is a little bit of a nice change and also knowing that every time I pay my rent, it's actually building my credit score, right? Uh, it's like shocking, by the way, how many people have bad credit scores, not because they're bad borrowers, but just because they didn't take out credit and now they're being penalized. Yeah. So like, hey, you were responsible, you pay your bills, you don't borrow money, but now you have bad credit, quote unquote, like crazy. Yeah. And so we changed that. And so we said, wait a second, why is paying your rent not count towards your credit? I mean, it doesn't matter if you work at Goldman Sachs or you're a starting entry level person or an hourly job, like that having a good credit score is really important, yeah. right? And so turning rent payments into the path to building credit history is, I think, gonna be one of the most exciting outcomes of this platform. Let's go full circle back to your mom and your dad. <laughs> yes. let's, see, let's bring your dad into this too. They both were tech entrepreneurs as well. What did you learn from them growing up and, and how did that influence your journey? A lot. <laughs> um, I mean, look, I think there's the number one thing that, you know, growing up, there was a huge value on education and hard work. And you know, I do, I do worry that a little bit of this is getting lost even in the mo in recent years. But, you know, my parents came here because there was this idea of the American dream, right? I mean, my dad grew up in a very poor village in India. The idea of even leaving the, like, the town was a crazy concept. And today he's building rockets to go to the moon, right? And so you think about the opportunity in the United States to be able to come and if you work hard and the best and brightest can, can rise and grow and be successful, that's a powerful thing. And I got to see it firsthand. But now I've also seen firsthand how many times that's not true for people. And so if we can fix some of those barriers preventing people, I mean, look, you can work really hard, but if everything you do just ends up going into rent, healthcare, and student loans, like, you're kind of stuck, yeah. right? And so if we can fix that, even in just a little way, right? Like, even whether it's just building your credit, right? Or giving you the opportunity to be able to afford the trip to the job interview <laughs> in another city because you paid your rent, right? Those little things matter. Right? And they can make a difference. And if you do, we can play our little part and 100 other companies can play their part. You know, hopefully we can fix that. Um, but that was something that you, you grow up watching and you just saw. It was that, you know, I mean, there was no work or family. I mean, it was one thing. Like, we were in it together to go build and win and, and create a future for the family. And I think you want that opportunity for everybody. Definitely. And I'm guessing you witnessed when it didn't work out. Totally. You see the ups and the downs and like, that's part of it, right? I mean, you can, you get built up and then they tear you down and they build you back up and they tear you down. And that's just, that is part of something. That's also part of the American dream. That's the fun part of getting to do that. I think uh, what's frustrating again is that when you don't get that opportunity, then you feel like you have nowhere to go and you feel like there is no chance. So screw the system and you know, that's it. And that's just not productive for any of us. Uh, and it's not helpful. People people want to win. They want to work hard. They want to grow. I don't, I don't think most people want to just, you know, sit back and have the government give them everything. Yeah. 
So what's your advice for people, whether they're starting a local business or they're trying to start something bigger than that? What would be like your three tips for them? I mean, it sounds so stupid simple, but are you actually solving a real problem? Like I can't tell you how, especially now that startups have become like cool, I think it's the worst thing that's happened for the ecosystem. Like there's a reason startups were meant to be started by weird nerdy kids like me. You know, <laughs> like it's meant to be a thing that you do because you're passionate about it and because it's a problem that you can't live without solving. Someone said to me once, they said, what's your, what's your idea? And I pitched him my first business idea and he goes, great. Now, could you live in a world where this doesn't exist? And he goes, if the answer is yes, stop wasting your time. <laughs> I mean, you have to, it's not even just passion because you love what you do. It's, does the world need what you're doing? Yeah. Right? And I think that applies to a local store and that does the neighborhood need it all the way to a global enterprise and does the world need it? Right? But it's crazy how many times someone says, well, I, you know, business school is, I think, one of the worst things for people these days because they just teach you to, like, draw a quadrant chart and a competitive SWOT analysis. And it's like, well, if this person does this business, can you be competitively better than that business? And it's just, it doesn't, no one asks the question, do people need it? Yeah. And it's yeah. not on any business school framework. <laughs> it's really simple. Like, human behavior doesn't change. People do the same. We're doing the same things we did 2,000 years ago and 4,000 years ago. Right? It's just we do it in new modern ways. And I think that's part of the innovation. Whether you're a neighborhood restaurant providing food for people to eat, yeah. people ate 4,000 years ago, right? Yeah. Or you're providing goods or services or you're you know, helping people communicate with others. I mean, maybe you were a mail service 100 years ago and today you're a messaging service or whatever it might be. But it's the, the same underlying behaviors. We just have to think about how to help people do it better and more efficiently in a more modern way. Stay kind. Where Kindness Lives will be back in a flash. Everyone is feeling the pinch with rising costs of living and socialization is becoming a luxury. But connecting with your neighbors is free and scientific research shows it can actually reduce financial stress and improve mental health and well-being. Nextdoor is 100% free and is a safe and easy way to find like-minded people in your local area to grab a coffee with, go for a walk, join a book club, or simply say hello. Download the Nextdoor app or go to nextdoor.com today. You were also handpicked by Barack Obama for his Startup America partnership. What was that like? Honestly, I think it's fast. I've always been fascinated by the intersection of government, technology, and culture, right? Because if you, if you really want to make change, it, people you know, in Silicon Valley, I think they have this mindset of, oh, tech, best product, and new technology wins. Like, that's just not true. Right? And at some point, you're going to get regulated out and you're going to get pushed out. And if you don't bring the policymakers along so they can help shape this in a way that works, which, by the way, credit to OpenAI, they've done a good job of engaging with that, it doesn't matter. And by the way, you can have all the policy and all the technology, but if you don't have the culture to win the hearts and minds of consumers, you're also stuck. Then you just sit in a room at Davos and talk to yourselves about your cool idea. No one cares, right? And so it's that intersection of the three, I think, that's super exciting. And I think that's, I mean, that's why I've gotten involved in multiple government efforts across the world to help with innovation. But really, it's just to be in the room and say, hey, here's a problem. We both want to solve it. Here's how I think we can leverage new technology to solve it. Here's how you can help make it feasible to scale. And now let's go bring in like lifestyle and culture to make sure we win the hearts and minds of consumers to actually move society in that direction. Absolutely. And AI is a, a very big topic right now. Right now, We recently launched a new feature that is helping people compose kinder posts using AI. But there's also some concerns around AI at the moment. I think if you work in the tech space, like we all feel a lot more comfortable with it than probably the everyday American does, like my mom, for example. <laughs> so what do you think AI's place is and how do we kind of educate everyday people about it? I mean, people were people were afraid of the cell phone, people were afraid of the typewriter, people were afraid of the computer. And by the way, all these things have changed and change is scary. Yeah. Right? But fighting change has never worked in the course of history. And so if you look at this and say, what's the opportunity here? What can this do for me? Right? I think it is important to ask that selfish question. Not how can this hurt me, but how can this help me? Yeah. Right? That's a slight mind shift 
Because I think that the approach of saying, this is scary, this will hurt my job, or this is going to change things for me, I'm going to fight it, is a guaranteed losing battle. Yeah, yeah. The idea of saying, hey, there's a new platform. Can I be the first one to leverage this in a new way? What can this do for my earning opportunity, my job prospects? How can I get better and smarter? And the coolest part about technology is you actually create more, more economic output per individual, which just means more income per individual done right. Done wrong, it becomes unequal, right? Yeah. Um, but there's a huge opportunity. AI is cool. By the way, you should think of AI as your own little assistant. Right? And the thing people also, I think, miss is everyone's use of AI is going to ultimately be a personalized reflection of them. Yeah. Like You can have twins, kids, and depending on what they see and learn, you can ask them the same question, you'll get two different answers. It's actually the same with the way that generative AI works. Based on the history of your conversations with them and the information you fed into it over the months, years, decades eventually, the responses it will give you are actually different. Right? And so if I said, write a script about Larry David and a comedy series doing X, Y, and Z, both you and I will actually get different outputs based on the past conversations I've had uh, with the AI assistant. We are also in the middle of launching AI to help local business owners, and that's really just to help them create better posts to reach local customers. Yep. Um, what do you think about local business and the place in the community? Because at Nextdoor, we really believe that local businesses help communities thrive. And I'd say they're kind of like our version of renters. Like we really want to help these people who are fighting the fight every single day get ahead and, and reach their local customers easier and in a better way. And how important do you think local businesses are to the ecosystem? I mean, it's, it's super important and powerful, but mostly because of the relationships that you create. And at the end of the day, people forget it's not just the goods and service. It's not just the goods; it's the services, right? And so you can sell the same thing, but if I have a specific service that I value, people pay a premium, right? A five-star hotel and a four-star hotel is just rooms at a hotel. You're paying for the service, and I think that's what local merchants bring to the table that you just can't replicate at scale. And by the way, there will be consumers who prefer just pure efficiency with no relationship, and there's gonna be a lot of consumers that prefer the same service, or same good with better service. Um, and I think that's where local merchants come in, and that's why they are such a bedrock of so many communities. I know you're gonna have an answer to this question, because everyone in New York City does. What are some of your favorite local businesses in your neighborhood? I mean, I'm such a restaurant guy. I just love dining, and like, like I live in the West Village, and I you know, go down to Dante all the time, and it's just a great, local spot with the best cocktails and little community. You always see people you recognize and it's a fun little spot to hang out and have great meals and great drinks. And I think for New York specifically, restaurants are such an important part and there's nothing more local than dining. We do a fun thing in this podcast with everyone called The Kind Carousel, where we get to ask you all kinds of questions. So here we go. If you could have any other career, what would your dream job be? Hmm. Well, I definitely want to be uh, one of the, I think between being an archeologist or a, uh, you know, one of the first people to go on the Mars expedition, like I love exploring fun, crazy new places. Who is the biggest celebrity you've accidentally spotted in New York City? There's so many. So to give you an example, when I was still living here, one of my friends came to visit from San Francisco and in one day, she, this is like an unusual New York City <laughs> experience, but in one day she ran into Beyonce and Jay-Z and Tom Cruise who was here visiting. <laughs> That's a big one. Yeah. Um, honestly, I, I, mean, I saw Obama when he was here. That was a pretty cool celebrity sighting. Yeah, yeah. That's a good one. I think mine was LeBron James, who was like very obvious walking through the streets of New York Hard City because he's so giant. Um, what's on your Spotify playlist? Who are some artists you're listening to right now? I'm such an early 2010s house EDM guy. I like that was for me the single best era of just <laughs> electronic music. It was the era of Avicii and Alesso and Benny Benassi and David Guetta. Everyone here at the office will tell you how much they hate me for playing it through the office all day and all night, but it is my, it just gets me in the zone and I can, I love it. You've done a lot, obviously, again, at a young age. What are your goals outside of business? So that, that I, I just, I take issue with that question because I think if you are focused as an entrepreneur, the goals that you want to solve for yourself and in the world 
are manifested in your business. I've been very fortunate not to have to work after my last company and the one before that. So if I wake up every day, I don't know what else I'd be more excited about doing than getting to build this. I mean, it's, it's just, there's something so much fun about creating products that people actually want to need and then seeing them use it and seeing the impact it has. I mean, even when I was, you know, on the opposite, forget about building credit on housing, you know, prior to this, I was running the product for Tinder. I mean, it was, it was fun. You know, you'd make, you could make one improvement based on customer feedback and you're going to change the way people meet all over the world in 24 hours. I mean, it's just, there's something really exciting about being able to make impact at scale and in a way that's good for you too, right? That you get out of a business. So I don't buy the business versus other uh, separation. Well, and I can feel that that's genuine because you can feel your passion, but I also did hear that sometimes you maybe sleep in the office. I, 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 I'm a, I don't, I'm a, I, I do, I'm a particular sleeper. I need a good pillow, but other than that, I'm pretty easy. <laughs> Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time today. Where can people find out more about Built? Can people literally, they can go get it so now? You can go to builtforwards.com. You can get the Built MasterCard where you can earn points at any apartment. We have over 3 million residential homes where you automatically get rewarded for this. Um, and I think it's just a really exciting shift in the mindset, right? If we can take life's biggest expenses and make them work for you, um, I think it could be a real, real game changer. Awesome. Well, I can definitely see next door and Built working together in the future. And of course, if you're moving into that new apartment, you're paying your rent on Built, you want to connect with your neighbors, you can download the Nextdoor app for free or just go to nextdoor.com and really great to talk to you today. Thank you so much.